This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with former long-serving Everton Academy coach, Tosh Farrell. He discusses his work in individual skill development and his role in this at the club, some of the work he did with Everton's great young players such as Wayne Rooney and Callum McManaman, as well as the importance of the environment they created and how this benefited the players. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you help its growth by sharing it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So, Tosh, really appreciate you jumping on. I know we caught off, uh, caught up a little bit off air there. Um, seems like all's all's good your end. All, all, all's very good. Yeah, life's good at the moment. Perfect. So, um, I'm really excited to speak to you. Um, I actually spoke to Lee Hodge, who's a former guest on here, and he said that how well regarded you are and how highly thought of by him you are and then obviously doing a bit of investigation into your work I can see absolutely why for people that maybe don't know you or haven't come across your work do you want to give us a bit of a whistle stop tour I guess of, of your career and then what you're currently doing oh well you know if, if I'm going too long don't, don't be frightened to, to to nudge me because you forget how long you've been involved uh, in the game but I started off um you know, not not a player at the at the highest level. Um, the little bit that sort of gnawed at me, if I if I can say that, Michael, is I played my, my best level of football towards the end of me of me playing days, and that was simply because I went on to a coaching course, and the coach uh, in that in that session said a simple thing like check your shoulders before you receive, and it was like. Uh, a eureka moment for me and I started doing it and it wasn't conscious that I wasn't doing it but we in those those years there was no way structure was the in in in, in real coaching but that helped me to improve my game uh improve the level that I was playing at and then it gnawed at me to think if I had to come into contact with somebody who was paid attention to detail uh to his coaching I could have played I'm not saying pro to pro was certainly a lot higher um, level than I was at. So I got involved in coaching, met, um, I came to, and, I, and I think from that moment, I've been so lucky in, in football because looking football isn't getting making your debut. It's about meeting the right people at the right time, um, people who have your best interests at heart, who can advise you, who can tell you, the bad as well as the good. I mean, we're all right patting each other on on the back, and sometimes a kick between the legs now and again isn't there, isn't it? Well, it's painful at the beginning, <laughs> but you know when the pain wears off, it's it's not, it's uh, you re- you learn from it. So I um, <clears throat> I then pursued the the coaching. The person in contact was I came into contact with with was Keith Mayer, um, who's you know. Rob plugging it, plugging his book. I think his book Gold Dust is 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 really um, re- revered by a, a lot of coaches uh, in in the coaching world, and and feel like that book uh, is real helpful and beneficial. And he might be somebody you might want to speak to at a, at a future date. But Keith put me on the straight and narrow. He took me under his wing, and I I evolved into uh, working for the FA as a Independent Centre of Excellence those days. It was pre-academy. I moved on to me full badge um, after a lot of weekly, monthly sessions. I, I must have trawled every every coach, every top coach in the country, all over the country, invested in myself. Um, not to get me qualifications. It was the thirst for knowledge. And aside from that, I was involved in a junior clubs and I was a lot of trial and error on the fields there, uh, working with sessions that were brilliant in the book. They never went wrong in the book, but as soon as the as the ball starts rolling on a field, when you've got this um, how to maintain a uh, stay compact in the top third of the field uh, with under sevens, you find that it's real difficult, you know. So I realised that I couldn't go in there with me 
Terry Venables mould at the, at the at the time. He was one of the leading coaches. I watered it down, started taking it and absorbing the information that I was seeing and hearing, and started applying it in a manner that um, I felt suited my style and my personality. Um, and that trans that transferred it to the players. The players picked up on it. I found that the uh, from there the knowledge to get better and go on courses, which it inevitably means that you've got to take coaching qualifications, was important for me because you sort of like cap your knowledge. You think, well, what comes next? And then the co next courses that you go on to through through the FA um, gave you that knowledge and, and um, experience of, of, of talking to other coaches, sharing what they did and what they didn't do right in their early days. Got me full badge, then went to Everton, uh, and the learning process for me started all again because it was all about dealing with the elite players, the players who could possibly do a lot of the stuff that I had formerly, uh, previously, I should say, previously been doing with grass, yeah, grassroots, grassroots kids handling the ball, manipulating the ball, and, and all that um, was my core and then bring it to an elite level to these kids who could already do it was a challenge to me which sent me back to me nose in the book again and asking around for all kinds of help and information which like i said a lot of coaches and you'll be aware of that once you're in this coaching circuit coaches will help coaches from there progress uh, to technical lead if that's what you know, I think I think I was one of the first phase coaches, if, I, if I'm honest. I think they've just rebranded it. Uh, but I worked with uh, under, under 14s originally. Uh, and Michael, if, if I'm going on too long, just feel to cut across me and all. Because I can talk for England, just chip in and say, hold it there, Tosh, I've got no problems with that. Am I okay to continue or do you want to jump in? No, 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 carry on. I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll pick up bits from here. I'm making notes as you're going along. So keep going and then we'll, okay. we'll revisit with some of the stuff you said. <laughs> okay. So I got brought in as a, well, part of my deal to, to, to go to Everton because I was Billy Big Time, wasn't I? I was, uh, I got asked uh, by Liverpool and Everton, would I like to, you know, join the academy? And uh, I was Billy Big Time uh, saying, well, what age group would they get? Because I think as a youth, as a as a coach, we all have this vision of you know, coaching under twenty threes or uh, or the first team. Otherwise, you're not perceived as a coach. And I don't, you know, um, the, the the information I got back was then you might be a bit inexperienced to take a teenage group. No, I'm doing a teenage group. I want the under, I want the under fourteen. So you know, I, I'd never coached eleven eleven in my life. I, the only time I coached 11 to 11 was on the, on the full badge. So, um, are you sure? Yeah. So I went to, and done the under-14s at Everton as part of, well, I'll come to you. And uh, while I was doing, doing the under-14s, believe me, the first session I did, I realised I was out of my depth. But right. the issue was, Oh, they were miles. I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it to stop it. You know, when you say stop, stand still or freeze, whatever the terminology, the ball was getting moved that quick that I couldn't. I couldn't get the words how quick the ball was getting moved. I was with some real talented players who could play. And my little one is here, you know, receive with the insides and the foot and all the rest of it. They were miles above that. Then when we went into gameplay, on the on the Sunday and the structures, you know, you know, the a four four two to a four three three to a three five two, changing the game tactically and the I was way out me death. Honestly, I've got no 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 issue saying it because a coaching badge is you, you know was just to say that you've got uh, to me uh, initial coaching badges, yeah, you've got the potential if if you work at it to become a, a, a good coach. It doesn't say you can coach. And I think we, we sometimes, you know, when we get an A licence here, we get an A licence today in the post, 
suddenly it's brought it broadcast all over social media. I'm an A licensed coach. Well, with the greatest respect, you know, you've got the potential to be an outstanding coach, and it's brilliant that you've gone down that route. But I'm telling you, the learning starts all over again. And you think so, the players knew? Uh, well, if they if they didn't. They were brilliant to me by not embarrassing me or hide or hide or, uh, or you know, by they were brilliant by not embarrassing me and, and exposing me. Um, I do think part of my um, coaching strength is my personality, uh, is my enthusiasm. And I think initially that, that swayed them into liking me. And so they liked me, they didn't down me. Um, I think within a short space of time, I had to realise I was um, I was short, and they that that led me then to being around all the other teenage uh, group coaches. So Dennis Evans, Neil Dewsnip, uh, they were there. Ray Hall was, was was taking groups. Colin Harvey, wow, what a mentor and coach he was. I was with putting extra time in coming through the day to be around Colin. Uh, to, to watch what he was doing and that made me realise what a good coach was, was all about. Um, Colin actually came to one of the games that I was coaching at under 14s and we got we got beat 3-1 by Stockport. He was um, a real good side at the time but with respect, individuals at Everton, we were better. Technically, we, we were better but I couldn't coach the game. And I always remember it was Craig, Craig Madden taking Stockport. He just changed the shape. I couldn't react tactically to the changing of the shape. Stockport won the, won the 3 1. And I got a phone call the next morning uh, from the academy manager saying, Can you come in at nine o'clock? Well, you don't get called in at nine o'clock yeah, to have breakfast at an academy. I'm telling you, you get called in <laughs> because there's an issue. And nine o'clock was the time, you know, people started work. So I got, went in uh, and I had a conversation that was, uh, at the time, it hit me ego. Because uh, it was, Tosh, we don't think uh, the 14s will benefit from your coaching. I'm thinking the next line is, we want to, you know, we're going to install another coach and unfortunately we're going to have to let you go. And that wasn't the that wasn't the, um, the the line that was taken. The first line was accurate. Tosh, you're not suitable for the four teams, so therefore um, we'd like you to take the under 11s. Tosh, I think the game's going to be a bit slower for you. The players are not as ta uh, tactical, tactically as astute, and you can grow with them. So ego hurt. Um, can I think about it? Well. There's not much to think about because that's the role we we want you to do. Uh, if you don't want to do it, we'll get somebody else because right now we don't feel you, you're suitable for the 14s. So with the arm on my back, uh, I reluctantly said, OK. Um, went to do the... Under, uh, we were working with the under-11s and it suited me to the ground. It was absolutely fantastic. I was learning... At a, at a, as a coach and developing in a smaller sided game. Uh, tactically, although the permutations were there, not as many, and there's not as uh, confusing, if that's, what, if, 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 if that's a word, you know, you didn't have to be a tactical genius, you only had to move one or two, as opposed to a complete overhaul of the system. Um, and I was growing in that and I was loving it. And then as that season finished, the academy manager said, hey, Tosh, can you come in? This time it was at 12 o'clock. So I knew it wasn't for the bully. Uh, I thought I was going to, could be getting under 14s back here. Like, you know, they might think I'm, I'm, I'm better. Um, I'm getting better. And it was, Tosh, we think you're doing really well with the under 11s. So what we'd like you to do now is move away from that group. So I'm sitting up, the shoulders are coming up, the chest is puffed out. and. Uh, We'd like you to do the under nines. I said, what? I'd like you to do the under nines. 
So I, I always thought you, you progressed with groups with 11. Then when you go to 11, you go to under 13. To under 13, you might get under 16. To under 16, you get the youth. And my progression was going up downwards. I always thought you progressed upwards. So um, Neil, Neil Dushner, who was the assistant academy manager at the time, said, we'd like you to do the nines. But don't be too disheartened because we'd like you to do the under sevens as well. And I'm sort of in shock. I don't know where this is going. And I pre, you know, I should I should stress that at this moment I'm a part time I'm a part time worker at the at the academy's doing the part time. He said, but don't be too disheartened. We want you to do the under sevens. He said, so you'd be responsible for the sevens, the eights and the nines. And he was selling it to me, but he kept the golden bit to the end. He said, how do you feel? I said, well, I thought I was doing really well with the 11s. We are. That's why we're offering you the under nines. Listen, let me come clean. If you take the sevens, eights and nines, it'll be a full-time position. We believe in you that much that we feel that it, it's an important part of the players' development. We feel you have the ability and potentially the skill set to uh, make it a, t a top programme. So obviously then, me, me self-esteem has just gone through the roof. Uh, I jumped at it, you know, loved, loved to do it. Uh, and that really started the ball rolling because the from there, from running with sevens, eights and nines, it progressed then to be in charge of the sevens, eights, nines, tens and elevens uh, in, in this full-time uh, capacity. Then we moved into the, the school time programme. You know, the, the academy then started bringing the kids out of out of school. I was I was overseeing the, the, the as a as my job as my role the sevens to twelves program. Then through the schools program, I was working with the thirteens and fourteens uh, through the day as we brought them out to school. Then I'd be working with the fifteens and sixteens, and then. On a Thursday afternoon, I'd be working with the under-18s. And all this work was centred around technical development, improving the individual. But I was doing it in a small group capacity. So we get a lot of repetition of, of, of the essentials, you know, that, that hadn't been covered previously. And through the week, uh, my work and week involved coaching every player at the academy from seven to eighteen, and yet to get there, I had to take significant uh, steps backwards. I felt I uh, I had to take well. I had the body armor on, so a couple of the daggers didn't go right through to the heart. You know, they, they got deflected. But again, I, th I think the point that I'm that I'm emphasising is there. These people who are in these roles. You know, from Ray Hall, Neil, Neil Juice, um, Colin Harvey, their experience was so important to help develop develop me. Um, I didn't see it until I was in there working with the players, and then realizing that I'm getting better at this. I'm getting more experience. I'm learning how players learn. I'm learning how players of you know, different, different, yeah, learning abilities, learns, how do you bring them up together? How do you keep Billy big time on, 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 on a leash, so, so to speak? Uh, how do you make sure that everybody feels equal? How do you make sure everybody's progressing? How do you, how do you help somebody who feels they should be getting pushed on? And using your experience to say, maybe now's not the time. Um, how, how do you deal with players who have had uh, an opportunity it slipped away from them? How do you deal with players who are being released? How do you tell players they're being released, they're unsuitable? All this skill set um, I was acquiring on a daily basis, adding it to me knowledge base. 
some of the practices I thought were were good. Some of the things, the working practices of that I didn't agree with, uh, and we sat down as a group, rejigged it, um, and, and I think it I think it was out of the time. And I'm not I'm not saying that we win a, a person first club. I think the culture was player first 20, 25 years ago. I think it's evolved into a person player uh, environment now. But I've got to put, I've got to be totally, totally honest. I feel that the group of people I was, I was working with myself, uh, you know, I would put heavily in that. I think 20, you know, that time frame there, we will, we were working hard to be a player, a, a person player first program. And I'll say that be, be, simply because the some players who we've had to release at a younger age, yeah, 9, 10, 11, you know, as young as, 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 young as that from 20, 25 years ago, I'm still best mates with it. I'm, I'm still, they, they get it, they understand, they, they applaud. The players that they were playing with who went on to make it, they applaud them and say, they had what a player he is. And I'm still in touch with him, you know, Tosh. And we talk about what they're doing now when they've got kids, they've got their families. Nobody has, has come back to me and said, you, it was all your fault I'm not a player. Now, I might have been, but like I say, if I have, nobody has, has come up to me and, and stated that to me. I think that shows the you know the importance that a coach can have, and actually the effect that a coach can have on a, obviously a young person's life. I think one one thing I want to pick on pick up on from what you said there, you obviously mentioned a lot around the developing skills aspects um, and how you manage group dynamics or manage individuals, and it seems like a lot of that's obviously come from wisdom of learning from others or learning from situations. But going back to your initial point of where they've identified that actually you might be really suitable to work across what's now called pre-academy foundation phase. What yeah. was it about your character or your style that you think resonated so well with children in that area? Uh, my style was, I, I brought myself down to, to, to their level. And I don't mean by kneeling on the ground so I'm the same height as them. I'm talking about uh, um, uh, the street talk, uh, the, you know, the your street cred um, with them, um, getting to know the the player, uh, getting to know getting to know everything about the player. So, um, you know, I'll, an example yesterday, uh, I'm I'm at, I'm at a venue, I'm watching. Uh, a young player, a, 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 a girl player, play who's who's in the program. Uh, somebody came over to me and said, "Do you know that player?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "Where are they from?" Formby. How many brothers they've got? Who the parents are? Could I identify the parents in a crowd? Um, could I identify one or two other kids a, a, around the day? And I, I just have this knack for getting to know the people, the, the, the player, and what's surrounding them, you, you know, because I think it, it, as, a, as, a, as a coach, if you're not aware of what's going on around with a player, you can't make an assessment of a player. You don't know what's going on in the background. You don't know what's um, could or, you know, or, or potentially could affect them at a future date that might hinder or stall the development. So I think the lads, when, particularly at that time, because it was all a male uh, environment, um, it was all about, I know what school you go to, I know your head teacher, I know how many brothers you got, I know it was your birthday yesterday, I know your dad's uh, parents are. And we used to have every one of them, I could name every parent in the academy. You know, and for every, for 200 kids, for 200 kids, that usually uh, comes with uh, 400 parents. But, you know, when you know the grandparents and their aunties and their uncles and the little sisters rolling 
and that little sisters of five and seven would give me hiya tosh and things like that. It we would got into it was it was people thought that at the time when Everton never had a, a, a part and forgive the French a, a, a person, we had we were had had to work in an environment that that wasn't it would get closed down now. It, you could hang meat up in 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 the summer. The environment was so uh, well, what's what's the word? So different to what it is now. We, you know, we were we were in a brick building. We were wall to wall, cold, and the kids thrived on the environment. And when do you think knowing all that helped you work with the kids? So, so you've got all this background information. How's that then helping you develop them um, from, I guess, tech tap psych, well, well, social point of view? Well, well, I thought that the, the I, you know, I, I can only guess what I'm what I'm thinking, but but I, but I, I do think that they thought that they may have been thinking uh, he likes me, he likes me, he's taking an interest in me, and because I was. You know, I am honest. I mean, one thing I I am I, I don't I don't bullshit anyone. It's the if I've got something to say, I'll say it. Um, not everybody agrees with it. Why, why should they? I, I'm not expecting them to agree with it. It's just my thoughts. But the lads, I think, appreciated the honesty. I think the lads appreciated that I would speak to the so-called best player. In the group, the same way as I would speak to what people would perceive as the as the weakest player in the group, it was a level playing field to me. Why? Because I didn't know at seven and eight who the best player was going to be. So you can't put all your eggs in one basket because you could let the potential best player, you know, slip out the net, turn against you, um, and I think. The parents and the players uh, appreciated that uh, that level of fairness that I gave across the group. Every group, I didn't, I didn't bend for this ego, you know. And, and Wayne got, you know, you know, one of the. I remember Wayne when he made his his debut at, uh, and he scored the goal against Arsenal. Um, and the next the next day, Wayne was, you know, we had John and Graham in the, in the program as well. And he came to watch us the next day on the Sunday uh, with, with with John, and it was a red hot red hot day. And Wayne's walking around with with, with no top on, you know, you know, just the torso. Hey, you get your shirt on. That's not how. We, sorry, Tosh, shirt went back on, and he put his training top back on, and he had it wrapped around his waist, and he just nodded like that. Yeah, I've. Um, I think that's really interesting because what that aligns to is the fact that actually it doesn't matter what you perceive performance is right now or potential might be that you as a coach and I guess you as a club have standards that everyone's going to be accountable towards, both yourself, because you're going to hold yourself to knowing the parents, knowing the aunts, knowing the uncles, knowing the sisters, brothers, etc., but then you're also going to be in a position where up and down the pathway you can go, no, that's not what we do here and they'll respect you for it because they know you're honest with them but coming from a point that you care not coming from a point of i'm going to be military style it's like i care you know i care and so because i care i can pull you up on these little things that others might not be able to absolutely and i think in this day and age we we see you know this creating the culture the the philosophy our culture our dna was 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 established that academy program then and and Wayne knew what the culture was uh, and to me that was a, a not I'm sorry Tosh he wasn't respecting me he was respecting the culture and the philosophy of what had been established and it was just nothing it was just a hot day he was he was one of the lads it's what lads and uh, people do when it's red hot it's what the norm was. And he wasn't doing it for any other reason. It was just that it was hot. And as soon as he was alerted to the fact, John, it's not what we do. 
he was the first one to say, sorry about that, whacked it straight, straight up. You know, that, that's, that's the relationship which I feel is so important in any form of, of workplace. You know, it, it, it's, it's an important factor that if you, if you can get that um, to the level that we had it at Everton during my time there, it, it was no coincidence that the number of players that we did develop in that period of time came through and players that may not have made us at, at Everton, per, per se, have gone on and had great careers elsewhere. I firmly believe that just those, that, that, that component, the creating that culture, creating that philosophy, and everybody, not just myself, adhering to it, was, was instrumental in them getting where they are now. This might be a hard one to answer from some of your comments earlier, but how important is it that you get buy-in from what are perceived as your better players? Because I can imagine if you if you have, for example, Wayne there, where you say to him, "Oi, put your shirt on," and he goes, "Ah, oh, Tosh, do one. I'm not doing that." Then potentially the other players in and around him, or that have grown up with him, were like, "Well, if he's doing it, I'm going to do it." And then all of a sudden, it's a free for all. But actually, if you've got what's perceived as one of your either higher performers or higher potential players and they are buying into it it almost consolidates that culture for all the others that will look up to that player or idolize that player or whatever it might be yeah. well you, you 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 say that and it's only when i te- when i tell that that story do i realize if if he just said up your tosh you know, I scored against Arsenal yesterday. My name's all over the papers and whatever. I'm a, so if he hadn't done it and walked away, I'd, I'd, I'm not so sure. I, I, I think he, the, the, the re, uh, what the repercussions might, uh, might have been, whether I fully understood them. But I was pretty confident in the relationship uh, with Wayne. I was pretty confident that knowing the person that Wayne and developed into knowing he, his brother is there in the under 11s and under 12s or 13s at the time, it's whatever age group it was. It, it never crossed my mind that he wouldn't do it. It never crossed my mind because well, we were Everton. This is what this is. This was us. This was why we were so strong. And and I, yeah, I, honestly, I've never had. I've never had it. And the the impact, if I, if I recall recall properly, you know, once I have this thing of uh, of selling tight, fasten your shoes, fasten your laces. You know, before I pass somebody the ball, I say to them, fasten your laces. They look down and I run past them with the ball, and they oh, he caught me out. It was one of those moments where, when Wayne put a shirt on, we had this um, tuck your t shirt in into your, into your shorts. When Wayne's putting it on, you could see people looking at the, or the young players, looking at their training shirts to see if it was tucked in the shorts. It hadn't come out you know, during the melee, during the, the running around. They were all fixing themselves because that was the culture. That's how we presented ourselves. And it wasn't military, certainly it wasn't military. It was, it was just the things we did and the, the culture that we brought the players up to do. Perfect. I, the shirt's tucked in one, Southampton do as well with socks and stuff. And I think it is what the bit I really like about it is when you're talking to the group and you subtly see one of the players nudge one of the other ones and say, like, your socks or your shirt. And you're like, actually, he's doing it in a way where he's not trying to call him out. He's not trying to be mean. He's just trying to help a friend out to say, come on, this is what we should all be like. And it's, that, I think that's a really nice dynamic when you can get that. But well, he, he, he's been over in the, in the US with, in the US with me because we had, I, ran, I, I did you know I ran a program and we were bringing in um, kids kids were coming in and as they step onto the field I would I would just say you know whether it was a, it was a male and female program that we were in then didn't matter whether it was John or, or Julie it was uh, off the pitch that's all I would say off the pitch and they go off the pitch. They go out the doors that they came in 
and they took the shirts in. They took the shirts in and they come onto the pitch. And nobody would say anything. Nobody would say, say a word. And they come on and then they go, hiya, John, hiya, Julie. Right, you know, where it was there. So like, and then gradually, the kids were taking ownership of it. As young kids were coming through the door into the sports hall, they would all be out. Have we all got our shirts tucked in? They'd be looking, tuck your shirt in. You can't go in there. We'll be off. We can't be off the pitch. And it was unbelievable. Tuck the shirt in. It progressed to the parents as they were bringing them in. Oh, tuck your shirt in, tuck your shirt in. And we developed a great culture with, with, with the parents on, on, uh, on that of um, presenting yourself. Because this isn't a, a, a football that you present you to, because we know the share comes out. But if you were going for a job interview, if you were going to somewhere, uh, you know, a wedding or something, anything like a social occasion, you want to be smart, you want to look the part. And these were all life skills. And the kids, we'd look a million dollars. when Whenever we went to, to games, everybody would be looking across and look at the way they walked onto the... We give the impression of professionalism. We give the impression of we've come to do business. And gradually, we got into, uh, or got to a level where we were mean in business. We were going onto and pro performing how we looked. Usually, we look great, so we play great. It's, it's really good. Um, and as I said, I like the fact that when you can create that, where they check themselves, it's brilliant. From a uh, I guess a technical point of view, looking at the foundation or the basics that you try and implement with those younger groups, what type of techniques or what type of um, skills are really important for you to have? Is there any particular beliefs you have around that area and what players should should be practicing or should be able to do? Yeah, well, if you know, and you you know, you you won't be the the first person. Uh, I'll ask this question too, and you probably know the answer because you look, you you may well have said, "Oh, I know, I know, I know what this question is." But if I said to you, "Who was the best player in the world?" Your initial response would be, "Be Messi." <laughs> and then if I see who the second player was, who Ronaldo. Was the third player, probably Mbappe. Neymar. Okay. The list goes Neymar. on. All the exciting ones who can do stuff on the ball. Yeah, the nobody said at the at the time. You know, and I'm going to use Everton, Everton players. Nobody said Dave Watson. Nobody said uh, Mikel Arteta. Nobody said anybody other than the forwards, the strikers, the dribblers. And to me, as a as a as, as a coach, and, and even the best dribblers now, and the way the game's pro pro progressed, where you've got the wing backs or, or full backs now, see uh, the flavour of the day. I mean, they seem to be the ones who are everybody wants to be. Um, they've got a, the, the, the skill set that they've got to have from a technical point of view is no different from Neymar. It's no different from Ronaldo. They've got to be good on a 1v1, they've got to be good on a 1v2. You've got to be able to receive between the lines, which usually means I've got a player in front of me and a player recovering from behind me and possibly somebody uh, blocking me passing line off in, into a midfield position. And I'm thinking, why would I teach them just to pass? Surely I have to teach them to dribble first and then work back from possibly who the best is Work back from how they develop physically, because I don't believe it in size. I believe if you're good enough, you can you can play anywhere. As, as you know, arguably Messi uh, and Maradona and, and, and players. Zola was cream of the day. I, I I studied Zola. Never seen a head anybody's head move as much as Zola's, apart from Frank Lampard's. What a what a bonus he is if, if he can pass that technique and skill. Uh, how Practices he uses to that to the play the club he's at he's at now. Um, Zola was there. It was all the players who who could receive, uh, quickly think what they're going to do next, whether it be with their feet or whether they're going to move on. And they were the type of players I based in you know my uh, individual technical development program around. And you know what? It's surprising how easy it is to coach. Uh, to 
dribbling sessions to young players. That was going to be my next question. How do you do that? How, how do you teach them that? It, it, how do you, well, if they all want to be Messi and, May, and, and Neymar and the Dembele, uh, Ronaldo's, it, they owe every practice, you, you know, and it might, it might change now the way this coaching philosophy is, uh, the way things are coming through. But at the youngest, youngest ages, we, I would say if we were there for an hour and a half, for possibly an hour, everybody had a ball through, through, through that hour. Through that hour, you know, if it wasn't a ball each, it was definitely 1v2 because we were doing uh, defence and attacking practices, attacking practices. And I set up the, the practices, the dribbling practices, yeah, um, to a goal from the tech. Initially, the techniques were from a static, you, you know, because we weren't on the receiving it. You've got the ball, take somebody on. I'm doing defending as much as I'm doing dribbling. When you when I'm up against a a weak dribbler as a defender, I can cope. Now I'm challenging myself because the program that I, I, uh, we developed, you've now gone from where trying to defend the weakest dribbler to the top end, running at you, and you were developing your your defensive skills while we were doing a dribbling session. If if that, if that makes sense to you. Um, and we were we had great success because everybody wanted to beat the dribbler. They, everybody, the dribblers, let me rewind, the dribblers always wanted to be successful and try things and be creative. The defenders, right, in the game that we did, were defending until they won it. So we had realism. They were, when they won it, they were out of jail. It was the jail game, I called it. They broke jail. They were now out of jail. And they were making it one up. They were trying extra hard to be a good dribbler. If you were in jail for too long, we, the, the sentence was be, you know, to get them out, I used to parole them. I used to say, right, you're, you're on parole. But, you know, you can get off. Um, somebody who's been there for too long, they were lifed up. And we used all these street street jargon, if that's what you want to call it, uh, and associating it um, to, to to development. And then from there, the, the the I used to say to the players, "What would you do if you were two two players there?" And Cal Mac, I'll use Cal Mac as a uh, Cal Mac um as a, an example. Cal Mac said to me, "I dribble past the two of them, Tosh. You can't do that." You watch me, Cal McManaman dribbling past two, right? So straight away, Cal McManaman has just given me progression. I'm going to develop sessions one v twos, and the challenge for the dribblers was to get past these two players. Do you realise? Well, I didn't realise at the time until I got to, I got I got told suddenly. Um, one of the one of the parents come into me and said, "Tosh, there's the bill." The bill before he said, I've just had my garden re -tiffed. I said, What do you mean, re -tiff? He said, He's never been out of it. He said, Them moves you're showing him. He said, And he's got, he's telling me how bad his garden was. He said, I thought the dog had been in there digging us up. He said, But they were all uh, now self practicing at home, learning new moves to bring to the, to the session. And then suddenly the session was starting at five o'clock. And they're coming around in that past four. And they're working in the corner. They're doing all this stuff with the ball. Then we're doing into foot drills and, and stuff. And I'm thinking, this one and a quarter hour session is almost a two hour session. They came early and stayed late. It was unbelievable. Would you isolate the skills or would you just give them um, guidance and saying, why don't you give this a go during the no. 1v1, yeah. 1v2? Well, see, I... And, and this is, you know, this is where I uh, probably don't understand the new coaching culture. Whereas, try this. How can you try something you 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 you've not perfected? How can how can you try it? Because if you try it and you fail, you're not going to try it again. If 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 that's making sense to you. So, and we had a we had a a group of coaches. Uh, Robbie Anderson, Paul Harris, Eddie Murray, Mark Quayle, 
we had players, um, ex-players, uh, top technicians who were selected for their ability to be able to demonstrate. Uh, they were selected for their ability to be able to, uh, they believed in the program. They, we, had, we all had, the, we all came from the same um, direction. We all was have input, but we, we, we introduced the game's moves. So when I'm saying I'm studying Zola, the moves at the team were, this is a Zola team. Here's what Zola, Zola does. He fakes, uh, he takes off the outside. He's just like a bit of a step over um, this move. This was Zola. And we perfected the Zola. We per perfected a Kocha moves. Um, we perfected uh, the step over, you, you know, uh, the time of when to do it before, uh, when it's too soon. And, you know, we give them a set of moves. And then our warm up became a coaches. Everybody be doing a coaches, um, uh, rollers. And then they'd be, we, I'd be introduced this self talk. Um, you know, my daughter is a, is a, is a teacher. And I, um, she, she mentioned about a, a teacher, French teacher. You might be more. Uh, up on this, because uh, I might pronounce the name right. It uh, began with a P, with a Peru, Pejo, Pe but he was a, it was along that that name. And uh, what what happened was he used to self talk the students. So if I've lost my keys, an example would be you've lost your keys, you don't know where they are, you self talk your way back. Where are my keys? I came in the house, I went upstairs, I went into the bathroom. Oh, when I went into the back bedroom to get my shirt off the drawer, you go to the drawer and there's your keys. So I sat and talking to the feet, inside of your foot, outside of your foot. Outside of your foot for dribbling is not the outside of your foot. It's that like toe, little toe to big toe, isn't it? Um, the inside of your foot, which part of, the ins of, of that inside of your foot would you pass with? And so we have these little practices inside, outside, laces, sole, toe, heel. And they would talk rhymes and talk to the feet. You tell the feet what part of the foot to you touch the ball. And they could do it with both feet. Inside, outside, laces, sole, toe, heel, other foot, inside, out. And then it was all, when we were coming to these moves, we break these moves down to outside, then go to your heel. And then the rhyme would be outside heel laces if that was a particular move we were developing. And as they become more proficient, they just stopped talking. And it would just become all the body memory had kicked in. And this is how, in those early years, we'd have them talking to the feet. I still use it, honestly, with under 18s, with under 18s, not in the program that I'm with now, but when I, I, I go to, what I would call grassroots program, we would do it. And your pro the progression in your session, it goes through the roof in, 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 in seconds. In seconds. I think it's interesting because listening to you talk there, I think um, for people that listen to this, maybe haven't listened to any others, there's uh, Dr. Phil Kearney did a podcast with me before Christmas on skill acquisition and he goes through some of the things that you're talking around where to do maybe isolated practice and maybe maybe where to do constraints I I have a food of thought at the moment which is similar to yours which is we don't ask kids all of a sudden to read Harry Potter we build up to that yeah, so the idea that you can just you can just go into a small sided game and expect them to be able to do a move or do a technique without yes. it down a little bit doesn't for me, I, I struggle with it. I struggle with that concept. Um, but the self-talk thing, I think, is really interesting of how you could tie that into visual, visualisation. So look, you mentioned about going around the house. Could you then tie that into where they are on a football pitch? So they receive at the right back. I'm going to do a double scissors. I'm then going to come inside. The winger's pressing me. So now I'm going to do my Ronaldo trot. And then I'm going to do this move to things. So all of a sudden, they're visualising where the techniques they're actually doing could take place in the game. And that might be a really nice little journey for them to yeah. go on during, with that self-taught principle. Yeah. And, and again, it's 100, 100% because I, you know, I, I, I mutter under my breath. I, I, I put my collar up to me 
but for, and I thought to myself, well, what the, what the f? You, you know, is is he saying? Um, I'd see, I'd seen instances where kids are dribbling, uh, and they lose the ball through through dribbling, um, and I heard the coach say, "Josh, why didn't you pass it?" And I'm thinking that wasn't the problem. The, the, it wasn't the fact that he's lost. It was poor technique. The decision to dribble was fantastic. It was the right thing to do. Now he's telling the, the, the player to pass rather than say, Tosh, what a great idea. If only you'd have practised more in the garden through the week, you might have got past him. Your name would be up in lights now. Everybody would be jumping on your back. Shout, well done, Tosh. And I sort of, and I'm using that as an example of how I would have reacted to that, to that situation. I, if I felt he, he dribbled and he was a better alternative, I'd, I'd still say, Tosh, not bad, but what else could you do? Then I think that guy's a discovery uh, as some sort of, of relevance. But you know what? You wouldn't, the, the player, in, in the in the groups that that that, 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 that have helped develop, the players would would dribble, a because they knew it was the right thing to do, and b because they were technically competent, and which meant that you had an eighty to eighty five percent chance of getting past getting past them. So it was high, uh, it was it wasn't a big risk to them, but it was it was a high reward if they did do that. Um, players would know that I wouldn't give give them any verbals. If they were unsuccessful, I, I, you know, terminology is at younger ages. Uh, and, um, when we when we were doing developing, and, and uh, I didn't use the word pass. I would say roll the ball. The where does the ball roll? It doesn't roll in the air. It rolls along the floor. So a simple term, uh, they used to call me rolls in, in, uh, at Everton. I would say roll the ball, which means pass it along the ground. You know, um, roll the ball. Uh, I use the word link. You, you know, uh, uh, who can you link with? I'm not saying Tosh pass to Bobby. Bobby pass. I'm saying Tosh. Who can you link with? There, I've got four options. Which one am I linking with? I'm, I'm not taking that decision making away from them. I'm just planting a, uh, a thought in the head of you know link. Why would I tell them to link? Because I used to draw the pitch in half. There's the white line. There's the halfway line. If you're this side of the halfway line, what part of the field are you in? Uh, I'm in the attacking half, Tosh. Yeah, do what you want. If you think you should dribble, dribble, right? But if you're this side of the line, what's the issue with defending, Tosh? What happens if you dribble and lose the ball here? They could score. What might you do in this half? Link. So now... I've got me half of the field uh, where my, my speech or, or my, my words that I want to use, the predetermined as it go out in one half, we're linking, link, link, roll the ball. In the other half, excite me, excite me, Cal, excite, excite me, Rai. And they would excite you by one twos. They wouldn't know when to link for a quick one two. They would dribble, they would run with the ball. But the, the defined line was. Black and white to them, wasn't it? This half we we have to be safe. That half we can be take a chance. And gradually, as we grew, the game grew. We then started working back from final thirds to defence and thirds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think what that will do as well for certain demographics or certain type of people, that clarity would really help them to say, actually, in this half, I know that I can express myself and do what I want. And this half, I might have to link or, or it might challenge me a different way. But having no ambiguity would really help. And those boundaries almost to, for, for them would be, for some kids, I know that would be really useful. Because at the times they'll go, well, when do I dribble? Am I all right to dribble out from the back? Have I got to be in the final third? It's very ambiguous. Whereas actually having that real clear cut. I uh, The phrase I use is skills to pay the bills. Yeah. As soon as you get into that thing, show me some skills to pay the bills. Show me something that I'm going to go, oh, I really enjoyed watching them today. You know, I'm there for, for work. But I want to enjoy watching you. Um, but I think, yeah, all those little terminologies and stuff, you, you can 
really resonate with the kids. And I think what you said there, using their language and street street lingo is, is really important to frame it in a way that's right for them and that age group at that time. Yeah, I mean, they only want to play footy. I mean, that's, that's all they all they want to do. They don't want to listen listen to you. Um, and we, you know, honestly, somebody somebody said uh, sparks come off the younger groups. The spark, you know, they, look at them. The sparks coming up. Their enthusiasm. You couldn't care their enthusiasm. You, the idea for me was to was to rev it up. You you know, get them. Screamers, you know. In, I was I was brought up from a, in a in a day where coaching um, excitement, you know, it was if you're commenting commentating on the game, that was taboo. You know, that's not what you do. And then I'm thinking, I've just watched Sarah Southgate there when we when we won in the semi finals of the world. He's got the hands up. He's got the fist pump. He's 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 on the touchline and he's he's encouraging. He's commenting. He's well played. He's clapping. He's encouraging. I was, you know, I, that that's the world I was bringing to our younger groups at, at Everton. Why? Because they were watching the match. They were listening to, you know, John Motson. They were hearing the excitement. So when they, they were winding up to shoot from 20 yards, like, he's going to shoot now, he's going to shoot, you know, he's shooting, he's gone, wow! The excitement, you were passing that excitement on. That's what the game was about. Which gave them, um, I, I felt, the, the enthusiasm to to want to do exciting things on the pitch. And like I say, it wasn't necessarily just dribbling. It was wall passing. It was playing round the corner. It was um, moving. The, the moves they used to run. Uh, did you see that touch me left foot? That touch left foot, touch me left foot. They would come over to you and say, did you see me left foot? Of course I've seen it. You, you, you might have missed it. But it was unbelievable. And then for the players, uh, are you, who was out then? Uh, oh, Daniel Day-Lewis was out in uh, My Left Foot, wasn't he? Yeah, the film, the idea. Um, we used to use terminology like that was the star of the, you know, it was a big film. And um, uh, are you going to be Daniel Day-Lewis Day today? Uh, yeah, what are you going to do? I'm going to use my left foot. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like trying to um, get these pictures and, and scenarios that they could relate to from every day into the football practice, if, if that makes any sense to you. No, uh, it does. It does 100%. I think that, um, as you said, just relating it, the, the, the one that I like to do, and again, I, I probably could have done this better to modern, like just everything, but I wouldn't call it a whipped cross. I'd call it uh, Arnold Trent or whatever it is, or a Beckham right. or the one where you smash it along the six yard box. They say the Valencia so that they've got a reference point. And if they want to go and look at that person, do it. Same thing everyone used to do with the Cruyff turn, but yeah. they've got a reference and they can go, oh yeah, look, I was doing the Valencia on Wednesday when you see him smashing it in, in the box. So I think that's really nice. Um, analogies for the players one thing I guess moving through the age groups now um looking at the older end is there any uh common threads or common factors that you've seen from individuals who have progressed through the pathway and then end up with good careers um obviously mm -hmm. you mentioned a lot of success in the players that you've had obviously Wayne Rooney one of the best English players ever is there anything in particular that stands out as a common thread between all those players well, yeah, I I think you know you know, and, and it's difficult for me to to say that because it looks as if I'm throwing uh, bouquets either at myself or or, or the or, or the program and and but um, Alan Irvin, uh, when he was academy manager of Newcastle, he could say he would come up and he he say I go and watch England. He says I wouldn't look at the team sheet. He said, and as they were playing, he could say, that's an Everton type of player. And he'd look at, at the foot and he'd go, well, there's a couple, yeah, they're there playing for England. And I think the trait that um, I, I am proud and was proud to be um, part of a, of a group of coaches that helped produce 
the Everton type of, of player. And when I look at the likes of, you know, Adam Forshaw at Leeds, when you look at his, his technique, he's outstanding. Jack Rodswell, technique, outstanding. You wouldn't know whether he was a left or a right-footed player. Ross Barkley, outstanding technique. Now, whether these players have, have achieved the heights that people perceive they, they, they should have um, reached, um, I take that as um, a, a, an even further compliment because what they're saying is with all that ability that they've been, that they, you know, obviously some of it's God given, and, and, and but with the program that they've come through, why haven't they achieved even more? And there's Everton players right across the Premiership now, as you'll be aware, right across the leagues. And for me, the, the, the skill set of checking the shoulders, receiving in the, in the right way, and better decision making on the ball. That's why I'm proud of, of the older players. We were, we were good. We had and developed good players, which was recognised through a non-team sheet. You just knew they go to Everton because they, they Everton have that. And I, and I think, you know, and I suppose I am blowing smoke a, a little bit, but I don't mean to do that. But when I was in the in the in the US, inside six years, people knew what players came into what what was the TFS program. Then they were playing recreational games or another team that they play for on a on a on a Saturday or whatever. And do they do tosh? Because all tosh players do that. They try this. They do that. They they try stuff there, and that stamp of player, right? Was was always sp spoken of in a uh, in a complimentary way, not a derogatory way. So I felt that even at, outside my time at Everton, players uh, were recognised that for the ability that they possessed as being nurtured in the right way, and they've been given license to express. Yeah, I think that's really good around the environment that you guys have created that you kind of got almost a brand if you like of what those players look like in terms of a, a cultural thing for them as individuals so be it a practice culture or psychological things is there anything that stands out as common or were they all very individual in terms of the way that the players well, progress again um I, 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 with the with the way treated as as in, as individuals, um, and I think that's you know without stating the obvious, I think that's not you know whether you've got a, a, a team. I never called uh, any group my team. Um, you know my my under elevens, my under twelves, my team won this. It was it was the group. It was a way. It was a it it was that. But when you're actually coaching them, you, I'm breaking them down into individuals. And, you know, I used to be conscious. I had have, I have this big thing of trying not to make an assessment of a player uh, between 14 and 16. Why? Because I knew that's around about the time, the first phase of, of, of growth development. So, you know, the set, you know, they go through that. And players used to get thumbs down it, it, leave them I'm not we shouldn't make a decision to let them get through it um, and to th th this day I still feel uh, decisions on on players are making at the wrong time um, I'm not saying that the decision that, that was made uh, was right or wrong I'm saying that the, the window for, for making decisions is, is wrong um, it, we had, you know, like I say, those growth spurts we used to used to avoid. I we, we used to. I used to. I, I didn't know that you didn't grow altogether. I didn't realise that my nose might go, and then my face grows to fit my nose. Um, when kids were going through growth spurts, particularly you know, fourteens to sixteens. Um, when they get the spots and the, and the, and the face and they go gawky looking and, and stuff like that, 
you become a bit of a, uh, you, you, you may become somebody who's, who somebody has a popper. So they go into the shell and all that ability and self-confidence that they grew has gone missing for a while. And, the, you know, the psychological effect of just the body changing uh, on them, not being able to do the things that they were so fluid at uh, previously, I think you've got to give them time for uh, nurture them, nurture them through it, explain, you know, and give examples of who has helped happened with previously, and get them through it. So that was that was big for me. I did I did have the on a number of of occasions we had um, parental pressure pushing down on them, uh, which affected them big time, um, and particularly on the on. At, on the lines that um, when they'd be watching a game and I was part of the process that I didn't, you know, I would be encouraging the parents to applaud, say well played and not in this like non-real football environment or oh, well played, a clap and come on. It was, get, if they play, tell them, get in, well played. I've got no issues with that. But don't give them a hard time when you don't do things so well. Uh, don't get there's some used to have groups uh, educating the parents, and then we know that's strong in the academy structure now. But believe me, I would put us as one of the leaders in doing it, um, and we felt we could do it twenty five years ago because. In the background, we've made all these relationships with the parents, this one-to-one, -one, being fully inclusive, that we could talk to a parent. And believe me, we, we, we did do it. Listen, don't like your manner on the touchline. You're too harsh on your son. We, your son can come to every practice. Um, you can come to the practices. We don't want you at the game of a Sunday. He said, oh, I, you know, I'm not going to name the, 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 the individual that I'm going to... That I'm talking about now. He says, What? I'll take my lads elsewhere, take them and destroy them. Or you can trust us and leave them here. The parent went away We for a month. It was killing him not to be at the games watching his son develop because in that period of time, you know, academy fixtures, they all think they play Man United, Liverpool, and Chelsea and whatever. It was that band of fixtures come up. His lad did it really well. He went back and he was telling his dad about the game and what he did and blah, 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 blah. And then the, lad, the man come back and he was a different person, believe me. And his lad, you know, from being a, let's say, an, a borderline uh, retention at 12, stayed right the way through to to youth to youth player. And it was because the pressure had been lifted off him and he was allowed to, to be him. Did the lad become a professional player? No, he never. But you know what? He was in that environment for a lot longer than he may have been. And during that time, he'd, he'd, he went on to play clubs like Barcelona. He travelled all around the world in tournaments. He... He, he grew uh, as a person. He went abroad uh, and studied in, in, a, uh, in a scholarship in, in North America. All that was provided simply because we were strong enough to say to a parent, this is us. Now, the other coin side of that coin is we, we had a, quite a, a really talented group come in. This was one of my me, me final years at Everton. Uh, we had a group come in and the, the play the group were warm. Every one of them from that group is playing professional football. Right? Some of them are in the premiership now, in the premiership now, they're playing professional football. And we had to uh, re we tried to recruit a player um, who was e extremely well talented. Yeah. So brought him in and the dance strong. Played, looked, did well in the in the in the practice, um, did well in the group. The lads bonded with them, 
and the parent came over to me, went smashing group that lovely group. He said, uh, how do you rate me lads with that group? I said, I think he's, he's going to be one of a number of talented players and I feel we can help him uh, develop and, and push on and give him a real chance of being what he wants to be, which was a professional footballer. He said, would you say he was the best in the group? I said, no, he's one of a set of a number of players and he's trying to box me into a corner. He said, well, he's got another club to go to, you know. I said, I know. He says, he's the best there. He's the best in that group. I said, well, I haven't seen that group. I don't know. I said, but we get to play them in a, in a few weeks. We, you know, he said, uh, tell me he's the best player and I'll let him sign. I said, I'm not saying saying that. And let me just tell you, we think that the player is suitable, but you might be unsuitable for our programme. And I think it might be in the best interest of all the other players that's in the group if your lad does go and sign for a another. We let him go. What was the consequences? Uh, two, two years later, that boy returned to Everton, uh, wanted to come to Everton, came to Everton, signed for Everton, and told the line if the, of what we were trying to do. Um, yeah, I think you've got to stand by your beliefs. And I be, at that time, I believed it was in the interest of the whole group that I took that stance, explained it to the academy manager, explained it to the assistant academy manager. And you know what? 100%. Great decision, Tosh. Move on. I think that's a really nice story in terms of just, um, yeah, the, the moral side of it and actually doing what's right for, for the kid, but also what's right for the club and long term, probably what's right for the parents as well. Conscious we're coming up to the time that we'd allotted. So what I'd like you to do just quickly, if you can, is discuss the work you're currently doing. I know we spoke about it off air and it sounds, one, really interesting, but two, I think the initiative behind it of how you can support players when they're leaving programmes is, is a really important message to get out. Yeah, well, well, currently I'm, I'm working for um, an organisation called FEFA, which is Fowler Education Football Academy. So it's a, it's a predominantly academic programme. It's a second chance, if you, if you, if you, if you want, to, want, want to call it that. But we, we're focusing on the academic side, but we do we are providing uh, a, a full football program, and it's for 16s to to 19s, and we're now providing opportunities, you know, A levels entrance into into university, uh, but we are still managing to get one or two players through to the next level of football, whether that's senior non-league, and in some some cases recently back into into the professional game. And I think when, I, when I'm looking at them and, and I'm working with the players, it, you can see uh, the faults, if, if that's why they've been let go, if, if that's what you want to call it. Um, but you can also see where, the, where they've been let down, where they've been let down. And it ties in brilliantly with uh, the next age of me, of what, of what, of what, of what, of what I believe in and trying to help them re-establish themselves as, as good players, re-establish themselves as, um, as, as a person and uh, find themselves that, listen, I want to be a footy player, Tosh, even at 16, 17, the dream's still there to be a player, Bring, bringing that sense of reality home to them, trying to develop that, that side to them, but also pushing this education. Now, education, you know, one lad's just become the video analysis for the professional club in, in, in London. He's getting to do what he wants to do. Uh, we've got lads over to scholarships in America now playing in, in the, uh, what is it, the, not the, the, the one below the MLS. Uh, uh, USL? Yeah, in the USL. So he's almost there. So these are the opportunities are, are there for them. But again, it's the culture. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, the lads, when the lads come in, all the staff, it's a shake of hands. It's a, how are you doing? They, they all take an interest in the person 
we all want them to be good footballers. We all want them to represent the college in a, in a football capacity on a Wednesday afternoon to the best of their ability. But it's a, it's a nice family there. And from that, uh, you know, I do my own stuff. You know, I have my, my TFS programme uh, that, that's working with any type of player, grassroots, uh, senior, blah, 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 uh, senior players, etc., etc., professional players. But, I, you know, I, I've lately been involved in the in the mention scheme for Liverpool Football Club's uh, Game on Academy. And that's using my experience to help them develop into uh, a better coach, mentor them, so they can go away, be a better coach to help the grassroots, to become professional coaches, whether it's for Liverpool or a another. I just feel that the, the skill set I've, I've got is is, is being utilised. I mean, I'm across all ages again. I'm across cultures. And I'm really en enjoying life. And football's been so good to me. Um, you know, I feel that I've still got an awful lot to, to give, but not, but to give back for the life I've had. I'm just trying to, to help. I don't tell coaches to do this or coach like this. I just say, here's what I did. Here's what I would do. If you feel it helps, use it. If you don't, nobody falls out. Nobody falls out. And so far, people feel that what I've got to offer uh, has been worthwhile and, and beneficial to them. So I'm, I'm in a good place. Well, I think from the back of this conversation, everyone will be able to see, one, the level of care that you go into with the players. And, you know, if that message is reciprocated to every coach up and down the country, that that's never going to be a bad thing. So last question for me, um, and this could be probably the most difficult one that I've asked today, which is who's the um, best player or coach you've worked with and why, or with or against and why? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it, it, there's phases of coaches, isn't there? I mean, some coaches are, are, are brilliant with, with certain groups, some coaches are, with older players. Um, best best coach um, from a youth development uh, phase when when I was uh, being mentored, I I would be putting Alex Gibson or Dick Bates. You know, I I find them inseparable. Uh, if I'm honest, as a coach, educators, as as a coach, you know, Colin Harvey was unbelievable. Uh, his organisation. His attention, attention to, to detail, getting the best at the right time out of players was it's unrivaled. And again, it's no, it's no coincidence that Colin was around and was the lighting the candles and putting. Well, I think David Moyes was lighting the candles, wasn't he? But let's say Colin was putting the putting the candles on the cake, not necessarily lighting them, but he put all the candles. And he was rounding the players off. Yeah, you've got this skill set. Um, here's how best you use it. Colin was unbelievable at, uh, at that. Um, best player I've, I've ever worked with. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to answer it. Because if the thousands of players that, that, I've, that I've worked with, whether it's grassroots or or professional, individually and uniquely, they were they were special to me, if I'm honest. And why we might have always got or might have been able to help them get to where they want to go, I do feel that in that time spent with them, they got a hundred percent to me. They give me a hundred percent to them. And that's what makes each individual the best player I've ever worked with. That's a really nice sentiment to finish on. So, Tosh, I know we haven't gone over probably half the things that we could have done in that, but amazing conversation. I think really good enlightenment to what went on uh, throughout some of your career. And hopefully we can do this again at some point in the future and go through I'd, the other half of many years. I'd love to. I just... I just need tell him to shut up, you know, and it's not a problem for me. Tell me I don't mind. <laughs> no, it's much easier when people talk than not. So, listen, really appreciate your time and catch up with you soon. I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.